Welcome. So um, as everybody filters in and finds a seat, um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Heidi Hubling, I'm COO of the Pre-Celebrator Program. So uh, Subs Allerton is a full service business law firm. And about uh, four and a half years ago, we uh, founded the Pre-Celebrator Program as a accelerator for early stage startup companies. So we surround the companies with resources, uh, mentorship, each company gets a $250,000 purchase package. And the space that you're sitting in normally is set up with uh, movable uh, pods of tables, and so they can set up however, configure it however best suits their team. Um, uh, so they get six months of free office space, so they get access to conference rooms, um, to office space, um, and we help them find funding, we help them to have curriculum, so we teach them how to do financial modeling, how to uh, do product development, how to do marketing, how to do social media, um, how to do a pitch, how to do basic communication, all of those basic things that they need to go and uh, do their initial fundraising. We also use our resources as a law firm to uh, make introductions to investors, to um, also help them do strategic partnerships and other relationships that they need to, um, that they need to uh, foster. Uh, we've had, this, with this class, not counting the new class that just came on board, we've had 22 companies graduate from the Pre-Celebrator Program over the last four and a half years. Um, out of the 22 companies, 16 have received seed funding, totaling over $8.3 million. So for early stage companies, that's, I think all but two, all but two of the companies are still functioning. Um, so really, really good rates. And part of that is because at the end of the six month period, if they're still progressing, I'll give them a three month extension. And you know, with that, I don't hold them out for more them. I'll continue to give them access to the mentor perks, or to the perks, to the mentorship. Uh, to all of our workshops and to the network that we have um, within the pre accelerator and the law firm. Um, so it's been a really rewarding um, program to be a part of and to help be an advocate and a, and a mentor to these companies. And it's been really good to see you with the really neat ideas that um, we've had through this program. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first company, which is Waller's World. Um, Kyle is a, a veteran um, as well as a basketball aficionado. And um, I'll let you know. Go ahead and start this pitch. Woo! Feels like a, feels like a, a price is right. <laughs> like you said, my name is Kyle Cox. I am the CEO and co-founder of Baldwin's World. Um, I'm a military veteran, I'm a little bit about myself. I played basketball, worked in basketball, and lived in the basketball life pretty much for all my life except for my military time. Um, that said, let's just jump right into it. What is baller's world? The term baller typically means somebody with a lot of money or somebody that's good at something, sports. In this instance, we're going to speak specifically to basketball. A baller is a good basketball player, a person who likes basketball. Uh, what is baller's world? The app, it is the largest marketplace dedicated to basketball. We call ourselves an interactive multimedia basketball platform, the only one on the market. Problems in the basketball community, anybody who's ever played a game, try to play a game, know anybody who plays basketball. It's pretty much universal. Where to find games, where to court, where to travel, where to go, people of equal skill level, um, coaches, trainers, how to schedule sessions, mm -hmm. practice games, things like that. Basketball, all this world is the solution to those problems. We allow people to connect, network, play basketball, find courts all over the world. We preloaded 12,000 courts in every country on earth. So no matter where you go, the app has functionality. Our team is what I'm really, really most proud about. Um, we've assembled a pretty strong team. All of us have a lot of experience in our respective fields. Myself, I've worked with some of the top sports agents representing players from Yao Ming to Steve Nash to Blake Griffin, um, working with all those guys on a lot of their personal project, projects and marketing. My co founder, Nick Dean, is also a uh, military veteran with me when we founded the app. And um, he's a full stack program in 25 different languages. My CMO, Robert Purvey, is the former president of Reebok. Adidas help do design the shoes and all the marketing and the products for Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, Alan Iverson, Sean Kemp. I mean, the list goes on. He was the president of AM1 Basketball. He is our CMO um, doing this full time with me. Uh, Fred Coates is our digital officer, social media wizard. Um, we're starting to implement our programs now that we feel comfortable with the product and everything we have going on. Fred Coates uh, helped tons of social media uh, celebrities that you hear about. The Black Chinas and the Kardashians of the world and True TV, those are his clientele. 
the rest of the team, we have one of our found, one of our uh, partners is also one of the original founders of Rockefeller Records with Jay-Z. Um, and, and NBA veteran Ryan Hollins from UCLA, 10-year veteran. We just have a really strong team on the field. And I think that puts us in a position to execute this problem. Um, little snapshots of the app, uh, this real simple version of it. Uh, log in, then once you log in, if you don't like the course that are listed based on your uh, GPS location, you can pull up the map, find courts all over LA. I think this was China right here. I just tested it in China to see how it looked in China. Pretty high. Um, a lot of stuff going on in China. They're really big on basketball. Uh, schedule the game, time, date, location, skill level of the players that you're, uh, you, you desire uh, to play. Because when you set your profile up, you can list your skill level. Eventually, we're going to get into peer uh, evaluation, so you have like a skills, a ranking standard, uh, a ranking system that uh, determines your worthiness as a basketball player. Uh, so. The guys who are two stars aren't showing up to the five star courts and vice versa because they don't want to play with each other, trust me. And then once you make this game, you can schedule it and it'll pop up in the feed of everybody in the area who may be interested in playing. That's the interactive part of the app. Uh, when I say interactive, multimedia basketball platform. But just to give you a size and uh, an idea of the market, everybody knows basketball is a pretty popular sport. It is the most played sport in the U.S. and the second most played globally behind soccer. It's the most watched sport in the world, though, even more so than soccer. Um, 7 million females play basketball, but you have 500 million people who play basketball daily in the world. 30 million in the U.S. and 16 million of those are just casual, pick up, ball, and just play guys like, like some of us are, I'm sure, on the weekend warrior types. Our go-to-market strategy is uh, three-pronged. We have the distribution part of it. We're partnering with companies like the YMCA, uh, <coughs> Parks and Recreation. We're starting in L.A. <coughs> and other uh, cities as well and counties and, and partnering with those guys. Uh, we've already started with the YMCA um, to, to tap into their user and their clientele. We have our marketing uh, methodology is kind of, uh, I'm excited about this because this is actually, you know, kind of has become, has become one of our, probably our biggest uh, thing right now. The uh, multimedia part. We partnered with ESPN Radio um, and ANSA is our sponsor, so we're in revenue now. So we're generating revenue after our public beta just launched this year. Are already generating revenue. Um, the ESPN radio show is our attempt to cultivate this entire ecosystem where we have a weekly show with ESPN. I'm not on it, um, but we have a team of people who are on the show, influencers, and the interview basketball players, celebrities, influencers, talk about the game of basketball, talk about the culture, talk about life, and through the basketball lens. And what it does is it puts us out there on this network and this platform uh, to get to casually advertise ourselves so we're not forcing it down people's throat. Just more of a fun way to do it, and it generates revenue, and it can go viral. Um, for example, we've had Byron Scott from the Lakers on there already. We've had another one, probably another one draft, picking the draft coming up, Markel Folks. Um, a bunch of socialites and uh, different celebrities like that. And next week, I'm sure some of you guys have heard of this, this gentleman, um, LeVar Ball is going to be on our show as well to talk about his son Lonzo and his $500 shoes and all the stuff you're hearing about on TV. So we're going to give him a full hour. Nobody else has done that. He's only gets five seconds, five five minutes on different shows. So we're going to be the first to do that with him, which I think I think that's a, I think that might you know, be a turning point for us. Um, but like I said, Anza, the major Chinese company, is one of our uh, sponsors. So um, uh, Slam Magazine and Tesla, we're creating. We're in the process of creating uh, cross promotional uh, uh, items with them. We also have our community outreach uh, portion where. We partner with YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, and do, do different free clinics for kids, um, uh, help out with their leagues, training, and, and we have our own initiative called CUB, which is the Community United by Law. Um, and we're really uh, active on that as well. We've already done a few things with YMCA. We want to expand on that once we are able to. Just our timeline, we're pretty much on pace right now. Some things have changed. Like I said, the ESPN scenario pretty much only happened a month ago, and it's really taken all for us. Um, but we're pretty much on pace, and hopefully our end of our, uh, the goal at the end of the year is to have about 50k uh, active users. We got a long way to go, but we're still starting. So it's a good goal to have. You look at some competitors we found out there. If you notice, there's about seven features that we I think we think are our main features: from court court location, game creation, um, player rating. We don't have that yet. But it's it's some it's we don't have it, it really hammered out to an algorithm, but we have a very general. Netflix type ranking. And um, premium accounts, video, photo content, league management, and a score, um, an affiliate store. 
And you notice none of the competitors only have a couple of those things. So I think we're ahead of them already with that. Revenue model, uh, advertisement, like I said, because of our sponsorships, we're already in uh, revenue. Uh, General, the general CPM model is a typical CPM model is ten dollars per thousand active users, but we're we're doing a little more than that already. But that's you know, go ahead. And ask <laughs> 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 uh, we have affiliate uh, uh, sales uh, portion of the app where we get ten to fifteen percent on any retailer who is interested in reaching their target demographic of uh, basketball players, shoe companies, equipment companies, things like that. And uh, premium accounts, we haven't activated that, that yet, but that's going to be more for the serious ball players who want direct connection to trainers, um, different different leagues, different venues, things like that that we have access to. We're going to provide that to our serious basketball players um, who are interested in that type of thing, from any, any level, from trying to get a job overseas, get drafted to little Timmy who wants to make you know, the team next year. Future opportunities, uh, corporate accounts, meaning companies like the YMCA, we want to be able to charge a B2B model, charge them a fee to be listed in our app on the geolocation portion of it, but also to uh, uh, be featured in that and highlight some things and get access to our partnerships and get access to our network to help build their brand and their business. So copy and paste what we're doing with the YMCA now to 24 Hour Fitness, Equinox, LA Fitness, Valerie's, whatever. Boys and girls love, but make that a paid model. Uh, content creation, like I said, we're already there in the bank over the past few weeks. Um, data and uh, navigation, league and tournament management, um, scouting and recruiting, and other verticals. We eventually want to get into other sports. We're going to start with basketball first. That's my baby. And I love the game, and I know the game, and we're connected in the game. Um, and instead of trying to serve all masters in basketball and in sports, we want to focus on the culture of basketball because that's a very unique thing. Most, most sports like that. I was explaining to somebody, runners have their own language they speak, uh, golfers have their own language they speak. You don't want to feel mixed up with everybody else, you want to feel special with you. We won uh, several awards in our MVP at this age. Uh, most, uh, most, probably the most notable one is the CES. We've got one of the best mobile app at CES in Las Vegas uh, with our MVP. So we're really proud of that. We want to host some other awards as well. We, uh, because we're in revenue now, uh, to fully scale our company, we're going to use about 1.5 million. Um, and that's going to go pretty much toward technology overhead of marketing. Muchas gracias. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Dave Waldman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Style MD. We're a mobile marketplace for personal fashion stylists, uh, as well as a customer engagement tool for retailers. Uh, there are uh, a few very serious problems facing the retail industry uh, today. Uh, there is what some people call uh, a downward spiral, others are calling it uh, the retail apocalypse. Uh, and it, this is facing uh, pretty much every retailer, not just here in the US, it's happening in Europe and India and Brazil. Uh, and it's primarily due to the behavior uh, and habits from online and mobile shopping. Uh, you also have uh, a legacy problem within the retail industry of um, not really being able to uh, target or focus on underserved markets. Uh, for example, uh, the plus size market um, sort of crept up on the industry uh, and uh, just this year we found out it's now a $20 billion market. Uh, so everyone is scrambling to now target uh, this market. Uh, and then, of course, because of all of the new subscription-based services that are popping up, online and in mobile, uh, this makes a dizzying array of choices for consumers uh, to have to navigate. Uh, so, amidst this doom and gloom, uh, retailers are doubling down. They're spending over $15 billion on mobile and online advertising alone uh, to try and target users. Uh, outside of their brick and mortar stores. Uh, and there's also data uh, showing that 89% of these retailers are all looking for some type of mobile solution uh, to hand to their associates over the next three years. So that's where we come in, StyleMD. Uh, we are a mobile marketplace uh, for personal fashion stylists. This is available in the App Store now. Uh, we allow users to come into the app, indicate areas that they're looking for guidance in. It could be office wear, maternity, bridal. Uh, and we match those requests up with stylists who've indicated that they have expertise in those areas. So today, if you're looking for a personal shopper to help you save time, we have that. Uh, if you're looking for uh, someone to help you with a wardrobe assessment for an event, uh, whether that's virtual through FaceTime through the app, uh, or in person, yep, you can do that too with the app. Uh, now, the real big step is in uh, when you're walking down Third Street Promenade and an hour before you want to go into the retailer of your choice, let's say Anthropology, Zara, H&M, if you want to be able to talk to a stylist and have them pull some clothes, well, you can't do that with this right now, but that is what we're working on, right? We're looking at turning these passive sales stylists into uh, powerful engagement tools for these retailers. Uh, and uh, really the case study uh, for something like this is that we're not alone here. You've got uh, retailers like John Lewis, major retailer out of the UK, uh, just last March, they invested about $5 million to hand 8,000 of their sales stylists an iPhone and app so they could do just that. Uh, create engagement with their customers outside of their store. We think we can do a lot better uh, than a single retailer and we think we can give hundreds and thousands of boutique, mid-sized, and even large retailers with a platform where they can get their stylist on board for $9.99 a month, right? And they can do exactly the same thing. Branded profile, uh, stylists who are in these retailers can engage with customers and drive repeat business, right? So our platform uh, is win-win for everyone. We benefit customers because they get deeper access to stylists from retailers and brands that they love. Uh, we benefit the retailers, or we help them uh, really create deeper engagement with their existing customers and help drive repeat business. And we're already seeing the existing freelance stylists promote themselves on social media. Uh, and so what we expect is once we start engaging retailers, uh, they'll be driving uh, a network effect for the platform as well. Uh, where we are, we launched the app um, last September uh, and we've steadily built uh, our user base, our stylists, uh, no marketing, uh, solely through word of mouth. We have about 400 plus stylists now 
uh, LA, Miami, Tennessee, um, and we have about 250 active users a month. Um, we're looking at uh, building out a lot of the retailer features uh, that I previously showed you by July, August time frame, and we're looking for 500k seed investment uh, to really help us build out uh, those features. The team uh, consists of a number of talented folks, including uh, my co-founder Wilson Choi, who uh, I've worked with before for many years. Uh, he has. Um, deep experience in building scalable platforms that range from half a million uh, daily transactions all the way up to 500 million daily transactions. And my background is in business development and operations, uh, over 10 years in uh, specifically in mobile marketing and user acquisition. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I will I take them now, and I'll also be in the back there uh, at the booth. Thank you. So through uh, machine learning 
and uh, um, artificial intelligence, we were able to filter the noise in 36 different ways so that we can pinpoint exactly the one produced by the cartilage itself. Then we created a device for medical, uh, for, for, for medical use, physically for doctors to have at their, uh, at their practice that comes together with a wearable that will be used after the fact, after any interventions, for monitoring the progress and for, uh, for recuperation, physical therapy, uh, recuperation, and also hopefully for use by people that are interested in, you know, in sports and <coughs> they need to know how their needs are, are, are working. So in, in, in this case specifically, <coughs> there is benefit for all the for all the persons involved in the in the food chain, if you will, the, the, the patients are going to have a, a, a better understanding about it, of what is going on and how they are uh, how they are recuperating. The providers will have a physical diagnostic machine and will actually create money by using the the, the wearables. And finally, the payers, which is a, a very important part, because they will save money. There is uh, unneeded surgeries and there is unneeded MRIs. This is substantially cheaper with the, than an MRI and will give the same information or better information, actually. Well, today, so far, we have developed a, an, a, an iOS app. We have developed a proof of concept <coughs> a prototype. We, we have shown this to uh, stakeholders and, uh, and they have been very happy uh, about it. We have uh, de develop the algorithm in, uh, with, uh, with my team that is present here for, for if you have uh, questions. We have IP uh, filed for the United States, Europe, Japan, uh, and uh, United, uh, China, and the United Arab Emirates. And we have, more, more importantly, we have listened so already to 3,200 needs so, so far. <laughs> what is our future? Basically, this year and next year is about certification. It's about clinical trials that we are going to compare our results with pictures, with arthroscopic pictures. And that correlation is that one that we are submitting for CE, which is the European certification for being able to serve medical devices, and for FDA. Uh, we're seeking 1.75 million to get us all the way to FDA certification, which is when we are will launch the company commercially. Uh, uh, my team is, is here with me. If you have any questions or you want to chat about this, please come and visit us uh, here at the back, and we will be delighted to answer your questions. That's it. So, Gustavo, you have developed a new way to develop information related to the bee. Uh, and you've got over 3,000 3, folks who have used it. Yes. What has been the key insight that that has revealed to you? It wasn't known before. No, but uh, many, many, many things that, that not all the time that an MRI tells you that you, are, uh, that you have a good, a good knee. It, it basically, it could not because what happened is that the MRI shows the the distance between the two bones, uh, but it doesn't tell you exactly the, the status of, of, of that cartilage. So the cartilage itself is so. What we are doing is uh, allowing people to actually know the status of their cartilage before they need to get an arthroscopic or a surgery. So you've, you've had instances where people come in, they have adequate distance of flying enough cartilage, but the cartilage was bad, which they didn't know. Exactly. And you follow them long enough to see the cartilage fail? Not, not, not necessarily that. We, we have been able to diagnose that they were in a, in a, that they had a problem when they didn't know that they had a problem. That's why it's the knee void. The, the void <laughs> The knee was talking to, to them, but they, they weren't even able to listen. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent presentation, Gustavo. Thank you very much. Well, I'm wondering whether the um, basic technology that you've developed is applicable to other joints of the body, such as uh, uh, the shoulder and the hip. Not necessarily, because the knee is particular. The kneecap 
it only happens in there and in the and in the jaw. Yeah, it's it's like over over the joint, uh, and that is the one that produces the the, the, the vibrations and the and, and the and the Yes. So we will have one for the for the new kids, <laughs> which is a big market. Yeah. 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 The 3200 was training the device, or that's just uh, both. Both. Just, uh, I, actually, we needed to validate that that we were going in the right direction, and secondly, it was to, to to train the to, to get to to a comfort level in the machine learning. But now we're going to the next step, which is actually comparing with pictures, which is what we did a big proof. So, so why do you need uh, federal uh, regulatory approval on? Because my company will be worth one thousand times more <laughs> with, with that. No, and more importantly, the, the truth is because we, we will well, we want to categorize it as a diagnostic machine, right. and for that to, to happen, it has to have a certification. So even even if you work with chiropractors or you know whatever else is you know physical therapists. That 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 wouldn't that wouldn't be necessary. And in fact, at the beginning when we were debating this, we were we were going towards a wearable, sure. or a sports wearable. Yeah. But then it's about value value proposition. So you change along the way. Yes. It's smart. Yeah. Yes. Is the goal to partner with a strategic like a Medtronic? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. More more with companies, let's say like Johnson and Johnson, that has a. a, a hospital medical device market, but also a retail market product, because we will be able to have both. What's your alternative if you don't get that FDA approval? Go where? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. The headphone jack. In 2009, the headphone jack was a one-trick pony for music. Then came along Square. Square found a unique opportunity to leverage that technology to build a $7 billion company. The charging port. There's 7 billion mobile devices in the world today that people plug and unplug every single day. But no one has built technology to bridge the powering of the phone and a connection with the consumer. Kind of sounds like the headphone jack. Until now. My name is Duncan Swayze. I'm the founder of Rally, and we built the world's first MFI certified smart charging cable which we use to build digital experiences and connect the real world with the digital world in locations with their customers both in the moment and when they leave. And the opportunity is massive. We can place charging cables in cafes, bars, restaurants, hotels, airports, planes, trains, automobiles, literally anywhere you sit down, there can be a rally charging cable in front of you. And we have the opportunity to place 50 million around the world. And the user experience is very simple. In those locations, with one of our charging cables, when you plug in, our PCB board in the USB side will talk to the phone and ask for a specific SDK built in to a partner app. It will then automatically trigger an SMS, push notification, or an email with a reward for that contextual location. And it will also deep link you within the app for, once again, a position for that location. Some examples of what could happen in the moment. You could book something, buy something, order an SMS, watch a video, <coughs> chat with somebody, or customer acquisition, a download. If you don't have the app, it will ask you to go to the App Store and download the app and leverage our tech for customer acquisition. Facebook makes $6 billion off of customer acquisition alone. 
So how does it work? We have patent pending technology inside of the USB end of our charging cable that when you plug in, it'll talk to the phone and speak to the SDK within a partner app or within our own app, and will then read that unique serialization that's connected to a certain spot in a certain location. We then send an API call to our back end, which will automatically trigger an action with a reward or a coupon or something in that contextual location, as well as deep link you within an app. So, sounds all well and good. <laughs> what have we done and where are we going? December, we received our MFI certification from the first smart charging cable from Apple. That took us a year. We then placed patent down. In January, we placed our first production order. April, we were approved in the Google Play and in the App Store. This coming June, we'll receive our first thousand iPhone cables, our first thousand Android cables, which leading through August, we'll place in over a thousand locations with current partners already in place. Come September, we'll raise another million and a half dollars to place another 15,000 units. And the unit economics per cable are fantastic. They're expected to make $10 per month and at a cost of just $7, that's less than a one month payback in a direct line towards profitability. And as I said earlier, this market's massive and nobody's doing it. With 50 million chargers, it's a $6 billion revenue opportunity. And we can work with all of these fantastic partners in all the locations they're looking to connect with consumers. And we have the team to do it. With our fantastic hardware and software engineers, we've been, able to, we've been able to get that first MFI charging cable certification, and we're well on our way to making this a reality. To date, we've raised $750,000 with partners like Liberty Global, one of the largest telecom companies in the world, Virgin Media, Techstars, and Tomorrowland. As I mentioned, in September, we'll be raising another million and a half dollars to place 15,000 units and help this company scale. Once again, my name is Duncan Swayze, I'm the co-founder of Rally, and if you'd like to come and check out the demo and see the tech, I'll be in the back. All right. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple different models. So um, for one, locations that have a digital presence, like let's say startups or McDonald's and com or Hilton companies that have mobile apps or want to work with a mobile app, they can purchase this and then pay a SaaS fee for the back end and data services. Or for small mom and pops, we can give this to them for free and help them monetize the power that they provide similar to Wi-Fi and help them also use the CRM data to then reconnect with their companies or I mean their customers when they then leave. So think Wi-Fi. So what Wi-Fi's been able to do, we're now doing for power. So these cables would stay in these locations and just be used over and over. Yes. And, over. and then there's got to be a model of replacement at some point. Yes. And Attrition. Well, yep. Okay. So if I don't have the app installed, does my phone fail to charge? No. It automatically it still charges, similar to Wi-Fi when you click on the ad and then you turn away and you still connect and still. So to know, yeah, exactly. Yes, but we. So I, what I will say is we have that throttle. So the tech is built to be able to say you need an app in order to do it. So we can force you to download, just like you're forced to put a credit card into your Wi-Fi or you're forced to download an app in order to go on Wi-Fi. So we can create that. We can also push that down the line. So let's say an app wants to have a, have a, an email. So we can create it where the power will turn on after the email. And then there will be essentially POS that lets you know email required for power. Okay. So it's it's a free charge. Free charge. Free charge. So it's a little. It's a great idea. Thank it's you. a little scary. A little so, scary. So you know, I plug in and I'm in, and so everybody's got access to what I want. Can I say no? Can I? Yeah, you can say no. But what I will. Okay. I can say no, and nothing will nothing will push to me. Nothing. Depends on if. We're built into a Facebook Messenger, Yelp. Depends on if the app is already on your phone. So if we're built in, if our SDK is built into Yelp Facebook Messenger, an app you already have on your phone, back end wise, 
it depends on what they want to do with the feature. Similar to Wi-Fi, like when you plug into Google's Wi-Fi and you click yes at Starbucks, technically you're giving them everything you're doing. So I'd say it's up to whether or not you have that app or not. And the terms and conditions are within the app. So part of the brand as well is the protection of the power. So knowing we're not pulling down, this is up to the app provider that you already have on your phone. Smart, get two apps. You get two apps out of the app. So each each cable is uniquely serialized. So in our back end, it works with in our back end when it asks, it will talk and automatically. Yeah. What do you do with the data you collect? So it depends. So the data that you collect is your phone number, your email, depends on the location we're working with, right? So when you're in a you go to Wi-Fi at the bar, you click on Wi-Fi and you plug in your email, that is going to a CRM system that that location is paying for, and then they're paying for that marketing back to you. And that's very similar to what we're doing. Which is wireless charging scare you? So which which type? Just wireless. In general, yeah, like general. Wi-Fi through the air, like U beam or well, no, I mean I know it's power on. Uh, you it's not they still have the little yep. you, know, you have to put it in order for it to charge. Yeah, so wireless, but it is. <laughs> so as far as what we can do, we can still add our chip to the wireless power hub, essentially. So we're, we're, we'd like to essentially own the layer between the power and the phone. What if they change the port and go to the Thunderbolt 3? So if they go to the Thunderbolt 3, we immediately change the Thunderbolt 3. So I mean, it's, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so Apple won't allow that. Apple has a lot of restrictions, which is why it took us a year to get the certification and build it. Um, to that effect, though, for Android users, would it, would, do you have a split for micro, uh, micro and USB-C? And USB-C, yeah. Um, I have a question. Will you speak to, a little bit to the, um, on the other side of the smart charging? about the capabilities for social and everything else. Sort of uh, like notifications? Uh, no, for um, the safe. Oh. So this is the public <coughs> portion as far as what we'd be able to do in public. But the vision is to essentially create a connection of the utility that you purchase every single day. So people purchase these millions every single day, making them smart making them be able to connect. So one thing we'll be doing with our technology is essentially creating a smart driving, uh, safe driving vehicle. So for teenagers, um, or anybody for that matter, a lot of us text and drive. We know we shouldn't, we still do it. When you're plugged in, it will block texting, social media, any services you should be using, it'll block that and keep the roads, mm -hmm. essentially make the roads a safer place. That's cool. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit about uh, the work you've had to do to integrate at each location, like the BD cycle yeah, layer? Yeah, so BD cycle wise is actually fairly simple. Um, almost every single location you go to, they provide charging in some sort of way. So you're at a bar, give it to them behind the bar. Um, you're at a coffee shop, they provide a charging port. Um, when you go to them and you say, you see all this stuff that you already do, we can help you add value to what you're doing, potentially make revenue off of that, and or connect to those customers in that moment. So the BD cycle for um, free is essentially, you already do this, we'll help you monetize, um, and then the goal is to, down the line, provide a CRM loyalty and marketing, exactly like Wi-Fi. Uh, can't you be the port itself instead of the cable? So, the next iteration is in the port itself. However, the reason we started with the cable is because most people don't walk around every single day with their charging cable. Um, and if they do, then your power, your massive power use, and good for you for remembering your cable, but people don't remember cable, which is why we started with that. But we can place the technical the walls in that one. So that's the next R and D on game. So is your secondary market up you hit all the public locations at home? Is the idea to get people then use it for their home church? So the idea is to take the you know the public tech and once again go, you know, we'd like to be the charging cable in your home to help you with something within your home. So essentially create a connected version 
um, wherever you are. So placing a bedside table, kitchen, work, um, we want to be able to connect, be able to help you in some sort of way. So add more value besides just the utility of the power you get. So is your goal then to be like a third party product or to get partnered with say Apple and so if, I would say the light. So in the consumer side, the licensing of the product of the actual tech itself. So let's say Spotify right. has a cord that's now in every single Target. It's a marketing play for them. It's a user acquisition play for them, um, and it's just really a marketing cost for them. So for the the mechanism making the cord smart or like the secondary market of, of, of safety while driving is it's all everything. So that's pending, but as far as the prior arc search, there's some good stuff in there. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. So up next, I'm very excited. Um, in January, we partnered with Peter Chotting of Creative Media, and I'll have him come up, come forward. Um, partnered with him, and we're very excited with the uh, uh, value he brings as far as the services and marketing space and expertise, um, as well as the help uh, with our upcoming um, the venture fund that we are, that we're, we're, we're doing here, right? So far, it's everything's yeah. not going to speak too soon, so we're very excited about that. So uh, coming mostly by the uh, end of this year, we will have a full-fledged venture fund as well, we celebrate and an outside of as well. So, um, do you need Yes.
you need to get in the game. So I was at Universal, and I, then this little thing called the commercial internet was starting to hit, and I, I got really caught the entrepreneurial part, and that kind of led me to changing out of that part of my career. And I was very fortunate to be placed at various times at interesting inflection points in the transformation of the media business through technology. So. In this, my, my wife and I joke around about this quite a bit. We, it's almost like the movie Zelig. Has anybody seen that movie? It's a deep cut, for sure. It's a Woody Allen movie, one person. Okay, oh, two, come, on. come on. Okay, so a few people have seen it. If you haven't seen it, it's really, it's, it's worthwhile. So what Zelig is all about is this, it's this guy who's dropped into all these great moments of time in history through newsreels. So back in the day when they made that movie, like 20 years ago, it was very high tech to have Woody Allen actually in, injected into the scene with Calvin Coolidge and Woodrow Wilson, and time and time again. So these great moments of time where Zelig was, and my first moment in time was when online communities were really beginning to happen. And there's a little company called GeoCities, <laughs> Does anybody here remember GeoCities? Okay, so when I was at Universal, it was, as I said, I was catching the entrepreneurial bug, but I hadn't heard of GeoCities. The CFO from our division, who I worked very closely with, his name is Steve Hansen. Steve, all of a sudden, and he was a superstar, all of a sudden he left one day to go to this little company, GeoCities, and we're scratching our heads. Why is this guy doing this? What's he thinking about? Well. Over the course of the next year, he brought over four, five, six different executives from my division, and he asked me to come interview for a position there. And I had the entrepreneurial bug to a certain extent, but I didn't take the leap until about two weeks, two weeks before the company announced that they had been acquired by Yahoo for $4.6 billion. <laughs> so, there's an example through that little journey in the online community game where I was a little bit, as an entrepreneur, I was a little bit timid. I didn't take the action and go all in and interview with Steve a little bit earlier. Had I? Maybe. Maybe I would have been there and maybe I would have benefited like the guy who just interviewed before me, who in a month being there, he made $10 million. So it was like, a, it was a near miss in that respect. But that led me to a different path, which was the digital music revolution. So the same time, it was the time of Napster and the you know the bad Napster, where it's here and here. <laughs> the the peer to peer you know, theft totally rocking the music industry. Nobody knew what to do about it. Well, there was this little company in San Diego called Music Match. Does anybody here remember Music Match? Another wild thing, because Music Match was, was the music software for ripping and burning CDs that was bundled on every single de desktop and laptop around the, around the world, really. It was distributed on every brand, Dell, Gateway, HP. So anyhow, Music Match had saw, had saw this revolution or this disruption happening with digital and how the kids were listening to music and thought it could do a better way, find a better way to do it through quality. So it had this crazy idea to negotiate label licenses uh, to get into the on-demand music streaming game. Now, that sounds like nothing revolutionary today, but at the time, nobody, Steve Jobs used to talk about this, nobody thought that anybody, or very few people thought that consumers would want to, what they call, rent music, rather than own music. Steve Jobs had a famous quote about that. But these guys believed. They believe that there's an on-demand streaming market and getting into that market and having a better alternative to Napster would be a real business. And Redpoint Ventures, and Redpoint's gonna come into play later on when I talk about something. But Redpoint, Silicon Valley VC, they saw it, they acted on it, and they invested in that risky strategy, but they believed. They saw the tea leaves, they saw what was happening around them, and they believed and they invested their money. And as a result of that, Music Match ended up being sold to Yahoo for $160 million. They did extremely, everybody did extremely well. Redpoint was very well rewarded. Um, but it was one where 
timing action, taking action in the face of seeing the forces around them and recognizing that. So that gets us to, right after that, um, I met a gentleman named Dimitri Shapiro. Dimitri is this techno technological genius who was based out in San Diego, and he found me after Music Match, and he had this crazy little idea to have user-generated videos that you could publish to the world online. So, me TV, essentially, where you could take your videos, upload it, and I immediately thought that was a brilliant idea. He needed a business guy, he was the technology genius, so together, the two of us started pitching VCs about this vision, which sounds kind of like YouTube, which it absolutely was, and it was before YouTube was even funded. It was well before that. So Dimitri and I packaged it up. He was great. We went out on the road. Our first pitch was cross country on the East Coast. And I remember on the way, as we landed on the way back, we had a layover, and we already had a voicemail message from the investor saying, okay, we're in. We're, we're in. And so Dimitri and I are high-fiving each other in the airport. It's, uh, here, here goes our dream. Well, weeks went by and nothing happened. They slow rolled, slow rolled, slow rolled, and got cold feet with the vision because they didn't believe. They didn't believe, ultimately. We pitched several other VCs and they were scratching their head. And there's no business in it. Nobody wants to see user generated videos. Well, so, Dimitri and I kind of went our separate ways at that point. This other little company in pitch, Roa Bota at Sequoia Ventures, of course, that became YouTube. And the rest becomes history, where YouTube was acquired by Google for $1.6 billion. Dimitri, to his credit, ultimately did raise capital, but it was well after that. Changed the name from TV Drive, which is what we had, to VO. And I don't know if you remember VO, but VO was a big deal. VO had big, big numbers. But what it didn't have was being first. And because it was second, it didn't have a benefactor of Google coming in to acquire it and protect it against the major litigation from content media companies. And so VO, as big as it was, was litigated out of existence. So there's another situation where there are venture capitalists and, and you know, bets are made. But action, the failure to take action in that particular case led to different winners, different losers. So seeing the opportunity, seizing, seizing it. So that was a myth. You know, there was another near miss. It was a great inflection point, great time to be in that game, but a miss. So that led me to the next one, and then this is the last word. I promise. So I was, on the, I was fortunate to then be introduced to a company called Sightspeed. And this was on the cutting edge of the online video communications game. Video chat, essentially. This is well before FaceTime, well before Skype video. And when I came on board, this is a company that was a technology in search of a business. It had no revenues, it had nothing, but it had a great IP, great technology. I believed, I, I believed that it would be something meaningful. But 90% of the world thought, and I heard it all the time, we had video chat at the 1964 World Fair, and it never became anything. So anyhow, so undaunted and fortunate that we had a patient small little VC. We were funded, we're, we're looking for, we're, we're scratching our heads, trying to find a way to find a business out of this great technology. But it was taking longer than we had expected it to take, and certainly longer than we had hoped. Fortunately, we, like I said, we had a patient VC because it was a small little VC, almost like a mom and pop, but they were real believers because they were engineers. They were deep engine rocket scientists, truly rocket scientists, and they believed that. But I could tell that things were getting nervous, um, a little bit edgy, and I could just feel the plug be, about to be pulled on us. We just about to be pulled. That's when the one of the lessons I learned about relationships came back into play because when I was back at back in the music match days, I was dealing with a guy at Dell, and I said that we were bundled on all these computers. I was dealing with a guy at Dell, a senior executive, and we negotiated that deal. And we kept the relationship alive. And so I had this idea to do a similar sort of thing where you bundle our software, our video chat software, into the hardware because they had just embedded the webcam. So I approached him with it, and he was intrigued, went over there, and remember, we were running on fumes there. It was kind of a last ditch effort. Went out to Dell, went out to Austin, and sat in his office, and this was a big day. Like, I had to get it. 
<laughs> and we met for about a half hour, and we then went to this little barbecue stand that was next to a, this gas station in Austin. It was pretty wild. And I remember over brisket, in about 15 minutes, we negotiated a per unit royalty deal, which essentially saved the company. And, the, and that led, that deal led to real revenues coming into it, which led to another deal with Logitech, which is another big webcam maker, similar to the story, and that was a very um, good deal for us, so much so that they bought the company. They bought us out. So we were on death's door, but we were just never say die. You know, never say that, trying to find a way, thinking of relationships. Okay, what, what worked at this company, what didn't work? And the fact that there were several factors there. The relationship at Dell, that guy saved that company, led to a great result, which then led to a great result for everybody involved. But it was also, yes, the relentless tenacity, but the timing there was the patience of the VC. We were early on the video chat side, the technology was a little bit early but they were believers and so they were patient money. So timing can be many different things. You can be a little too timid like I was once. You can be you know, right on and jump on it like Music Magic did. But then Sightspeed had to wait a little bit, but we had a, a nice result. The bottom line is the lessons that I learned, and I think that are broadly applicable to many of you here, uh, is that being an entrepreneur is terribly exciting. It's Certainly not for the faint of heart. You know, you are definitely, you are approaching life and, and living your life without a net. And it is, um, it, the lessons that I learned were, were the timing aspect of really, rec when you recognize the opportunity, that jumping on it, taking action, and again, this is the whole fearless media piece, where you take action, get in the game, and if you're, otherwise, if you're timid, it's, it really is game over. So that's a big thing that I tell my clients, whether they're major media companies or small companies, that you gotta just get out there and be relentless, tenacious. Think of every possible relationship you have and how you can use them, but authentically. Not just taking, but giving. Giving to them and offering that up. The relationships matter over and over again. So remember the Steve Hansen story of GeoCities. Well, Steve, who's a multi-gazillionaire, Steve and I stayed in touch, and yes, he never has to work again because he did so well. But he's like you guys. He wants to keep creating. And so he has this new digital first media company and he, because of our relationship and we kept in touch, I'm now a board member of that company and I believe in it. I absolutely believe in it. So relationships come back. And then finally, again, as entrepreneurs, I've been there where you're fearless in the face of fear because you all feel it. You can't talk about it. You can't. You can't, you can't say I'm scared of investors or your team or anything like that. But being an entrepreneur, you just plow forward because you, it's just the way you are. And it's without a net, terribly exciting, but I really applaud all of you who are up here doing this because it is not for the faith of heart. So I'm gonna tie this back now into what I write about, which is taking some of those lessons to what's happening in the media and entertainment. So Netflix, of course, is the granddaddy. It is the poster child for the digital media revolution. How many of you, I'll ask it this way, how many of you here do not subscribe to Netflix? Okay, well, that's more than usual. But I would say it feels like about 10% don't subscribe to Netflix. In any event, stock is at an all-time high, and now in more than 200 countries around the world, it's the best of times, right? Well, I'm kind of bearish on Netflix, actually. And here's why. You look at all the competition out here, and yes, Netflix is so far ahead of them when it comes to numbers, but you have massive players like YouTube, which now has YouTube TV. You have Amazon, which is into video in a big way, as we all know. Hulu, AT&T, with DirecTV now, Sling. Apple is starting to do originals, and you know it's gonna get into that game. And then you have so many others, media company, or marketing companies, brands that are becoming media companies. Small little guys who are focused on niche audiences, international players because we're in a borderless world. And some of these guys, like YouTube TV, Amazon, Hulu, and Sling, they now are true cord cutting alternatives. They have the live linear TV, the local stations, all of that. Netflix doesn't have that. 
Will they get there? Maybe they will. We don't know yet. But these are real existential threats. And here's the thing about these businesses. It's different than when you have your cable or your satellite, where it's not easy to switch provider. If you're not want, if you're not seeing a series that you like on Netflix or on any on any one of these other guys, you can leave any time and just sign up for another one. So customer acquisition is one thing, but retention is another. And another major threat for Netflix, Netflix is a one trick pony to a certain extent when it comes to monetizing. Netflix has its business model is making money from the content itself, from the subscribers. These other big guys who are very much focused on the same space and doing it differently as I just described. They have multi-pronged business models where the content service is just the draw to bring you in to their, their world where they monetize their, under their fundamental business model. So what I mean by that is like Amazon. They use video as their video services and their music services as marketing to bring you into their great store in the sky so that you buy, 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 and then keep you there. They don't need to make money directly from the service like Netflix does. It's a very different ballgame. It gives you a tremendous amount of freedom to undercut pricing and things like that. YouTube TV, of course, we know what Google's world is like, and Apple, we know the game there, where Apple, they've always used the content as marketing to bring you in so that you buy the hardware, that's the big business for them. So there's some real, real threats. So ultimately the question is, Netflix has been bold, and they've been rash, and they've been fearless. They're going to have to continue to be fearless in order to succeed. I believe they will, they will try, but it's not like it's a slam dunk that as far ahead as they are that they're going to stay that way. Let's not forget, <laughs> the this is the digital media cautionary tale. Blockbuster, I think all of you will remember Blockbuster. The Blockbuster was everywhere, and they had the world, you know, they, they had it. And it was such a part of our lives, and they saw, the, they saw the same forces that we did. And then they were up against Netflix, kind of, but, and Netflix has net in its name, so it's not like it was subtle, but Blockbuster just was the quintessential deer in headlines. It just didn't know what to do, and it stuck by its core business. Ultimately, it moved, tried to move into this world, but it failed because it was too late. Netflix was so far ahead, and the management team at Blockbuster just didn't get it. They didn't get it fast enough. One more cautionary tale that I'll talk about just briefly. I put Yahoo up there because, yes, they were just acquired for four point two, three, something like that, billion dollars um, by Verizon. But let's not forget, four years ago, five years ago, Microsoft made an offer for something like $38 billion. And they had a brand that means so much. They have some great content. They had an opportunity, I believe, to be a real leader in the video space, and they just couldn't get their act together. They just didn't move fast enough, and they had too many layers of bureaucracy. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. I can see them in the cautionary tale. So really quickly on the music side. Spotify. How many of you here have Spotify? Okay. So you see how big Spotify is. Spotify is everywhere. The global leader by far when it comes to that kind of service. Uh, it's going public later this year in kind of a strange way, not your typical way is what they're saying. So it's the best of times for Spotify, right? Well, <laughs> you see the same names up here. The same problem where Spotify is kind of a one-trick pony. They're trying to break out of that a little bit by becoming a video player too. But they monetize the content, whereas Amazon, YouTube, Apple, they don't. And not only that, Spotify is nowhere more <coughs> profitable anyhow, no matter how big they are. They're not even close. So can they be a standalone service? I've written about this a lot where I don't believe so. I don't believe Spotify can, I don't believe Pandora can, and lo and behold, just in the last two weeks, it's been reported that Pandora is looking for a buyer very aggressively right now, and it's because there's no, there's no there there by itself. There's a lot of value there in the hands of the right big player, multifaceted player. So in any event, bottom line is that this whole concept of being fearless, and in my book I talk about, I give my fearless five for 2016, and 
These are the five companies that I consider to be the most fearless in the digital media space. And fearless doesn't mean that they're going to win. It doesn't mean that the actions they're taking are going to succeed. No. What it means is that these are companies that I respect the bold moves they've made and they've made really aggressive, game-changing, in the positive or negative move, uh, uh, moves. But Netflix we talked about a little bit already. Six billion dollars on originals last year alone. Massive. Into 200 countries, now into China. So that's fearless action. Now what are they going to do next? What's their next act? AT&T, of course, a couple years ago they were just communications. Then they bought DirecTV. Then they bought Time Warner. Deal's not closed yet, but $85 billion deal for the content. They need the content. They're thirsty for it. Facebook. Facebook has transformed itself tremendously in the last couple of years. Um, getting into video in a very big way live video, recorded video, and a few years back when it bought Oculus, people were scratching their head. Very few really understood the logic there, but now we all get it. That is, the VR is just another platform. It's not a unique thing just off on its own. It's another way to experience content, so it's a very logical progression. Verizon copied AT&T essentially, by well, Yahoo has their own TT service, and I put Magic Leap here for a reason. They're the most enigmatic AR company, tucked away in Miami, or not Miami, but down in Florida. And the reason why I think they're fearless is because their investors have plowed $1.4 billion into this company at a valuation of about $4.5 billion. So whether that's smart or not, we'll see, but it's certainly fearless. So what does this all mean at the end of the day for this transformation of the media business at the hands of technology in the digital world? Where you have all these kinds of things going on, well, certainly this is the reality. We have seen this movie before. From the beginnings of time, technology is always transforming the, the world of content. So we'll go back to the Victrola. Uh, for those of you who really know Victrola, that's not actually Victrola, but close enough. So, the Victrola was seen as something that would really disrupt the live experience. And so there was fear at the time that people would stay home and just listen to their, you know, their, these recordings and not go out and see musicians, etc. Well, we know that didn't happen. Both worlds lost. Television, of course, came on the scene. The movie business was threatened by that felt, and was really scared that people would stay home and just watch TV and we know what happened. They did all of that and more, so the pie expanded. The Betamax came out and I think many of you remember the massive litigation there. And what happened? Well, people started really recording stuff, but they hated the fact that it was crappy. And so they went out and they bought their VHSs that had the nice features and sleeves and all that and DVDs. So they spent more and more and more. So I believe, that I'm an optimist, I believe that this fundamental transformation of media is a great thing for the content creator and those in the ecosystem. Because now, of course, it's 24-7. You can find anybody around the world anytime and reach them. And the great thing about it is that so much of this that I'm talking about is happening here in Southern California. It's not Northern California, it's Southern California. You know, there's spectacles, the OTT world, music, esports, um, VR, AR. There's so much of it going on here. And that's why, yes, with Stubbs, we just created a new um, seed stage, early stage, digital media and tech focused venture fund. Just, this is hot off the presses and the first time I've really talked about it to any group. And we're gonna be focusing on the best of the best uh, seed stage, early stage companies. Um, very happy to be with Greg Axelrude who's in the back, um, Scott Alderton from Stubbs, and we're also very, very pleased to have Brad Jones who's one of the founding partners of Redpoint Ventures, as blue chippy as they get, who's one of the founding partners of this new firm. So this is, and we're here because we're not exclusively looking at Southern California companies, but you can bet that the majority of companies we invest in will be Southern California based companies. And we will be active investors, and we will use our networks and really help companies grow. So we're excited about that. And this is why my company created media which is a business advisory firm and connecting firm and the strategy firm. That's why we do what we do too, because there's so much great stuff going on down here. 
So this was a different sort of presentation than my book, but if you're interested in a snapshot of where the digital media marketplace was by the end of 2016 and where it's going, again, you can get a complimentary copy. Feel free to take one. And that was my story, but the real stories are the stories of everybody who was demoing. And these are the new class members of the pre-celebrator right now. Great companies that I've spent a little time with. Animate objects, swap it, tap that app, rent space, and cache. And they're all here, so I urge you to meet with them, talk to them, and listen to their stories. And thanks.